welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I am back today with me. I have the one and only. <laughs> Took that from you. Just kidding. Um, I have Mr. Josh Sedgwick with Josh Said What podcast. So don't forget, down below, smash that subscribe button because we're back, folks, with another episode of Beyond the Ink. So yeah, we're back. This is this is odd. Normally, we would be I'd be tattooing, getting your story. Mm -hmm. But since this is Beyond the Ink 2.0, um, and since COVID has or did wreak havoc on my podcast, um, I said, "Fuck! I need to get back out there." But you're probably wondering why Josh. Well, here's the thing. Josh has his podcast, Josh Said What? And right now we're filming one, two, three, four. <laughs> We've got four cameras going because we're doing a simultaneous podcast, which I don't know if that's ever been done before, but it perhaps may be a first. A little bit about you. How did we meet? <laughs> you know, it was actually it, pretty funny how we met because it was at Samurai Soul 6. I had just spontaneously reached out to, I believe, Taylor, right? Taylor. Yep. Taylor, Taylor and Ransom. Fabiano, yeah. We had a meeting with them and when I had it set up, we came to do interviews and that's when I came across you because I was over in one of the corners doing weigh-in interviews with all the fighters. Mm -hmm. I think it was actually after I just interviewed DeAngelo Ty, yeah. that's when I walk, walked up to you and we started talking. I learned about Beyond the Ink and I was like, okay, we, we got to We got to link we, up. We got to link up somehow. We got to get this uh, get this going. Um, and well, for my viewers that have not seen for a while, um, a lot's been going on. And when he said, I saw you at Samurai Soul, for those that you don't know what Samurai Soul is, um, Two years ago, well, I, yeah, I was 45, I started, I needed a new something in my life. I was kind of going through some stuff. Everybody was, I was too. And I found myself walking into a Muay Thai gym, of all things. Muay Thai, okay, cool. Like, that sounds good. That sounds like uh, we're gonna have some fun. Punch somebody in the face, <laughs> punch me in the face. There's a lot of frustration going on, so I'm like, all right, here we go. And that's what happens with the pandemic. I kind of let out that frustration. Dude, seriously. But what I didn't realize is that I walked into one of the best Muay Thai gyms that I could have ever found. You know, nice. um, it was brand new. In fact, um, when I walked in, we didn't have a floor yet. There really? Was some, some, no, we uh, Wow. Cyclone Muay Thai in Surprise, Arizona, um, run by none other than Fabiano Cyclone Aoki, um, who is a world heavyweight champion, WBC mm -hmm. heavyweight champion, who won his title in 2012 in Thailand. Wow. So meeting him, I was kind of like, oh cool, like this is a you know nice guy, really you know really gentle. Um, he was setting up interviews to kind of like meet who is going to be, you know, joining the gym and, um, talk to him. It was only supposed to be like a quick, Hey, how's it going? Some of you know, I talk a little bit, <laughs> a little bit too above average, if you will. But Hey, that, that just brings you, you know, fun personality. You get to interact and people yeah. actually get to know you too. Dude. I didn't know who he really was, and then, you know, analytically, as, as I typically am, um, I looked him up, I saw him on YouTube, I saw his fights, I saw everything, and I was like, wow, he's the real deal, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and the gym, once it got put together, everything got, was like, so now it was Fabiano, um, 
his brother Ishmael Aoki, who's a phenomenal Brazilian Jiu Jitsu yeah. mat. Like he's just he's amazing. Like the whole team is amazing. Like you said, Taylor, uh, Taylor Ramsey, who is uh, she does all the the uh, logistics and everything else that promote. Mm-hmm. Like she does, she's phenomenal. But she's also a killer. I love you. But you're also a killer. <laughs> like you're also a killer. I've seen her. <laughs> I've seen her rolling. She's like, uh, I think she's a brown belt. Don't quote me on that. Um, but she was rolling with these dudes, right? And I walked in, you know, for something. And then I see her just like, and I see this guy wearing her as a backpack. And she's like, oh, like, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> you know? So, so she's phenomenal. Um, her husband, he is in charge of, uh, uh, Frank Ramsey is in charge of the mixed martial arts, you know, portion of it. So you've got Muay Thai. Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, mixed martial arts, and like everything, and it's, it's just a phenomenal gym. Um, I immediately fell in love with it. Nice. So it was, it was great. And then Fabiano said, I'm starting this fight promotion. It's gonna be called Samurai Soul. I was like, great name. Um, <laughs> and Samurai Soul One happened. It was cool. We went, you know, we're sitting there and uh, I don't know if most, some people know, um, I don't know if you knew, I've, I've been doing stand-up comedy for like 12 years now. I remember you were telling me about yeah. that, yeah. So I jokingly had told Fabiano, hey dude, if you need an announce, uh, like any type of announcer, I could do it. I do weddings, bar mitzvahs, you know, I'm not afraid. <laughs> yeah. I've done a lot of stuff in my life and a lot of it has been in front of a camera, not too shy. Um, and he's like, no, 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 I've got somebody. Or you're good. It's, like, it's no problem. All right, cool. Um, fast forward, we go to Samurai Soul One. Mm-hmm. It's great. It has Muay Thai, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, MMA. We have our own, you know, uh, uh, full octagon, you know, in there by that time. And so we're just doing there, you know. And and the announcer, I don't remember his name, but he was really cool. He was like. He was good, he started off peak, you know, he had great voice, everything was cool, and, and then little, like, down the road, he just wasn't doing what Fabiano wanted. And if anybody knows, uh, you make sure that you do what Fabiano <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like, you keep that like energy high. Just, yeah, keep like, that energy, keep that, you know, going, and, and um, you know, it was, it was funny because he was more concerned with like how he looked and he wanted to interview the fighters and Fabiano was like, dude, stop interviewing the fighters. Yeah. These are all amateurs. I don't want them to be, you know, they, they don't know what to say. Um, we just need to keep it moving, moving, moving. You know? Yeah, especially if you're on a time crunch and oh, if yeah. like, you have to get through to the next fight, you know, everybody, it, the whole thing is on a schedule and that's what I think a lot of people don't fully see is that yes. it's like from Fabiano's position and Taylor's position, they're thinking about like every single second and how much it counts. 100%. So one night we're, we're uh, everybody's you know, got the music going in the gym, everybody's, you know, fighting and doing everything else. Mm-hmm. And these two guys that are in the gym, they're, not, they're I see knuckleheads, but they're funny as all hell. They're good kids. Everybody in there is good, good person. Um, they go into the octagon and I just took it upon myself to go, Live from Surprise, Arizona, by way of Cyclone Muay Thai. You know, and I just did this whole, <laughs> like, exactly. yeah, just, just just went for it. And um, and I said, you know, like, fighting out of the blue corner. He stands five feet nine, but we all know he's five feet seven. <laughs> you know, and so I'm joking. I'm having a good time doing it. As I'm, like, you know, throwing things around and, yeah. and, and sparring. And... Um, Fabiano was like with the pads and, and he stops and he's like, because everybody starts laughing. Mm-hmm. I thought it was funny, you know, and, and he's like, is that, that, is that your voice? And I was like, that's, that's my voice, coach. He goes, okay, you're, we're, you're, I'm going to use you. Those out there in YouTube land, um, I started announcing now. So now I am doing ring announcing, added that to my resume, um, which is crazy mm-hmm. because I did Samurai Soul 2. Once I did Samurai Soul 2, I had no idea, like, really, like, what, you know, I've got a, an okay voice, you know, like, whatever. Yeah. And I've watched UFC and Pride and, like, all the other, you know, um, fight organizations since I'm going to date myself. <sighs> UFC 1, 
yes, I was a sophomore in high school watching that going, we all need to kick each other's ass now. <laughs> yeah. I love watching Bruce Buffer do his thing. Like, yeah. Bruce, He's okay. you're the man. Like, by the way, you know, it's phenomenal. So I'm watching him writing things down so I would know what to say. Well, being there, um, I got hit up by, well, I got noticed, I should say, from the production coordinator of Freedom Fight Night, which is a more I remember you telling me about that, yeah. yeah. Professional organization, uh, Sophia Magana. And Sophia Magana is Benson Henderson's uh, sister-in-law, because Maria is married to Benson. Yeah. And Maria is Sophia's twin sister. Say that 10 times fast. So anyway, this is, you know, she said, called her boss, um, Harrison Rogers, and I know you've met Harrison. Yeah. Phenomenal guy. This he's guy, honestly a really nice, cool guy. He's absolutely family oriented, really soft. I mean, he's just a, he's just a great guy. So she calls him and says, "Hey, there's a guy here who I like the way he looks. I like his voice. He's wearing a suit. You know, I think he'd be good for our organization. Let's go ahead and you know see if I can hire him." So sure enough, she hires me, or they hired me for the uh, Freedom Fight Night too, and that was crazy because there's cameras everywhere, full production, and I was a little nervous. I'm like, this is my legit second time doing this, and yeah. it's for a professional organization, and I'm like, here's Frank Mir, Tito Ortiz, Rampage Jackson, um, Every, like, the who's who. I mean, just people that I've watched their careers, again, for a long time. And you have to, <laughs> now you're in the position where yes. now they're the ones watching you. And I'm trying not to, like, fangirl out. I'm really not trying to, like, fangirl out at all. So I'm like, whoa, the balls. Um, and it was cool. It was, it was a lot of fun. Um, I got paid very well to do that. And uh, they recently went with another, well, they had gone with another announcer mm -hmm. after that. I totally get it. I didn't have the experience, you know, that I was, you know, doing and that I needed. I didn't, you know, very humble for doing that. Mm -hmm. So fast forward, now I've done Samurai Soul two, three, four, five, six, and just recently seven. Nice. We met at Samurai Soul Six. So there you have it folks. That's the story of how we met. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to ask you too. Yeah. I wanted to ask you too, like, you know, from you didn't have any experience from that section and then jumping into Samurai Soul 2 and then you did Freedom Fight Night 2. Yeah. Was how much of a difference do you do you think there was compared to watching other people do it and now you're the one that has to have all the preparation, make sure oh, you do dude. everything right. Dude, night and day. It was insane. I mean, I had cameras like le legit right here in front of my face. And <laughs> and I was like, fighting out of the blue corner, da 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 da, you know, and I'm just, I wasn't prepared for that. Nobody prepared me for like boom cameras and people on the, on the cage and people doing this. And then, you know, seeing a lot of these fighters that I remember watching them when they were brand new in their careers. Mm -hmm. Like I met Tito Ortiz and Ryan Bader and like all the, I met them when they were like, young you know like, yeah. i'm talking early 2000s um and but i've always been into the fight game the whole production side it really opened my eyes to yeah. what it takes for people to do you know behind the scenes from the weigh-ins to everything mm -hmm. and and uh i got hooked i like it <laughs> i liked it um it was uh it was a, uh, and, and i like doing it i think it's fun i think um you know, again, working with Fabiano, who is, I can't stress this enough, amazing. Um, just his drive mm -hmm. is so inspiring. Like, he, his motto is, I don't like to be comfortable. Why? Because I just want to keep going. I want to keep yeah. doing better, doing better, doing better for my life, for my family, for, you know, for everything. And I'm very, you know, again, I'm inspired by that, mm -hmm. you know. Um, his work ethic is just, you know. Yeah. So when he's not mashing fights, doing all this stuff, planning for the next one, he's also doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, teaching Muay Thai. Big dude too. Like well, the first time I met him, it looked like he was a foot taller than me and a foot wider than me. Like I was like, okay, I should probably take a step back. Yeah, <laughs> and, and his, I say, you know, I can take a punch. <laughs> his punches, his kicks and everything, I mean his hands are like, 
stone elbows or stone his his shins and his and his just his feet when he goes bam you know if he, if he turns one over on the bag the 200 pound bag big old Muay Thai bag and he turns over that hip to just mm -hmm. kick and it's like do you hear that <laughs> that just that thud that's brutal oh yeah he's he's the real deal and then if you if you go on YouTube um, and you look at like his fights you look at who he's fought where he's fought um, you know he was the Arizona State representative for the WBC Muay Thai yeah exactly. I remember you telling me about that and then they promoted him to the global ambassador for the WBC Muay Thai. Wow. For, yeah, it's and professional. It's like it's it's crazy. So, what we're doing or what it, what ever we're doing with um, Samurai Soul, it's now become one of the biggest and best promotion Muay Thai promotions on the West Coast. Yeah, by far. Um, in twenty twenty four, it's gonna be. I mark my words. You guys heard it first. You know what I'm talking about. It's going to be phenomenal. You're going to hear, you're going to see some, I mean, the fights, you've been there. Yeah, I remember. There, oh, <laughs> there were some brutal fights. Dude. We got that last one that I covered, too, because there were so many great fighters. Like, yep. when uh, D'Angelo Ty fought, um, yep. I, I forget, the Tyler Shaw. Yeah, oh, thing? Tyler yeah. Shaw's a beast. When they fought, that was an incredible yeah. fight. Yeah, oh, and then he just oh, broke yeah, his jaw. Oh, yeah, Gerard Rodriguez. Oh, when he broke his, his, oh, it was gross. It was a compound fracture. Pretty gross. Um, I remember when it happened. He just he fell, rolled his boxing glove, popped thing thing popped right out. Damn. And people that didn't see it, I'm ringside. I'm like right there, and I was like, oh, fight's over. Then everybody's like, what are you talking about, Mike? He fucking broke his arm. <laughs> like, who? And people are like, oh, uh, like you know, <laughs> yeah, that's a bone. Yeah. And it was, was crazy too because I had just met Gerardo. Um, back at when, uh, when he fought for Ruff, he did uh -huh. MMA, he fought Dane Flores. So it was, I didn't expect to meet Gerardo at that uh -huh. event, and then I got to do an interview with him, and then his kid was there. Mm -hmm. That was also the hard part. Like, that's what a lot of casual yeah. fans don't understand fully, is that, you know, it's, with it being a brutal sport, like, you want to involve your kids, you want to, like, show them, like, you know, yeah. like, this is a source of inspiration, but at the same time, the love-hate relationship, that it was when I was hearing his kid cry, I was like, oh, I felt so uh, bad. Yeah, and and to and he's a great fighter too. I was Absolutely. so excited for that fight. That fight was like, oh, I'm so excited for that one. And then, literally, snap, fight's over. I I hope too he's still going through a good recovery because oh, absolutely. I know he had um um Fabiano. He actually started a GoFundMe. Yes. For him to help yes, raise funds absolutely. for that because. You know, with it being amateur with okay. Muay Thai, yeah. you don't get the full coverage. You don't have as much money to be able to cover bills like that. 100%. And especially when you break your arm, a compound fracture mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, that's more. He had yeah. what two surgeries. surgeries. Yep. Mm -hmm. And it looks like he's doing good. It looks like he's he's good. starting his road back. So nice. Yeah. You know, it was cool to see Fabiano start that. You know, GoFundMe. Yeah. And again, which makes Samurai Soul. The best promotion out here, best Muay Thai for honestly, I've seen a lot and I've heard. You know, again, me being the announcer, I get to talk to a lot of the fighters. Mm -hmm. I get to talk to them one on one. I get to, um, you know, just see who they are, mm -hmm. uh, get to know them. Yeah. We we uh, link up through you know Instagram or anything like that, and um, so I keep, I still keep con you know, in contact with them, um, and uh, a lot of the fighters have all given such positive feedback like samurai soul is one of the best promotions i've ever been on i'm like dude it's only amateur wait till we go pro mm -hmm. and we're on the way to go pro now, how you know, many uh events uh do you guys have planned for uh, 2024 um i know there's going to be some really big things happening in 2024 can't really say it sorry about that spoiler no. <laughs> <laughs> uh but the next fight is in october and okay. um, it's going to be a point, you know, towards your WBC. And again, road to the green belt. That's where we're going. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, you're going to see nice. the green and gold, and it's going to be fantastic. And yeah, uh, I can't wait. <laughs> so how did you get in the fight industry? How did you get into... Because you, you were doing a podcast, or you're doing a podcast called Throwing Hands. Yeah. And... 
by far one of the best names for a podcast, <laughs> for a fight right. podcast. You catch these hands? Um, you know, so, so how did you get involved with that? You know, funny enough, um, so I've had friends in high, since high school that have been fighters like JJ Nelson and I actually helped JJ uh, with his pro debut. So I was part of his training, I helped him get his licensing, nice. and uh, I was I was managing him for his first fight. Mm -hmm. And we ended up uh, competing, I think it was rough 46 last year, back in, I think it had been March. Yeah, March oh, of last year. Mm -hmm. So we go there, that's why I met uh, Roan Aaron from MMA Stalker, and I was like, hey, I gotta introduce myself. And then just after that, with the first event, I linked up with MMA Stalker, and I was actually interning with them for a year. Nice. Hence the MMA Stalker shirt. Shout out. Shout out. <laughs> and then it Should've was... Should've a Samurai Soul shirt. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Shit the bed on that one. But no, then it was... I think it was the third event that I covered under MMA Stalker, because I was primarily doing interviews. So Wayne interviews, uh, if I could, post-fight interviews, and then just helping get B-roll and highlight real footage. Very cool. And uh, my boy James, he's the he's the CEO, and he owns uh, ASAP Sports Network. Oh, okay. He okay. saw me at one of the uh, the weigh-ins, and he ended up hitting me up, saying, "Hey, I love to work with you. You have really good energy. You're you you know what you're talking about, yeah. and everything." And I was like, "Hey, let's do it." And then after that, we it took a couple of tries because our schedules were so busy. So we had like two cancellations on the first two shows we were supposed to do. Yeah. But then on the uh, on the third time around, we're like, "No, we gotta get this done." So, and then since then, <laughs> exactly. and since then it's like, it's crazy the buildup that we've had. Cause like me and James, we've only known each other for like literally this month marks a year mm -hmm. since we met, we got to know each other and we've been working together nice. and it's been like, we always say it's like yin and yang. We've, we've interviewed, oh gosh, I think like over 200 fighters just in the year alone. Dude. And it, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy how fast this industry, the whole fight industry, how, how fast things move. And I'm not just talking like, boom, 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 you know, that's the best part, but I'm talking like the production, you yeah. know, and the people that you meet. And and the cool thing is once you open one door, you walk through that and you meet somebody else. And like, again, everybody's got a network. So I meet you, we link up with Instagram or everything else, and then my network and people are like, oh, who's Josh Cedric? Oh. Let's, let's check them out on Beyond Ink. Start off again. <laughs> My followers are, are, I hate followers. The people that subscribe and support my channels mm -hmm. and Instagram, Facebook, all that good stuff, which I highly, highly, highly respect you all. And I thank you all. I do. That was my wrist. Um, <laughs> I'm all hot, hot, getting old. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's great, you know, and, and we can't do things without people that mm -hmm. uh, aren't in our corner. Uh, bite joke. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but it works out. It works out really good. Um, the people that you meet, you know, again, here I am in a cage, then I'm in another cage. I mean, well, I got out of the cage. But um, now we have the best ring, you know, out it's professional rings you know you've seen the yeah he bought a brand new oh, back at uh, God, Samurai that, Soul 6 that Muay Thai ring is <sighs> like it's it's badass yeah, I, very nice I've heard the USMTA judges and officials um, they've all said the same thing wow this is an amazing ring like yeah I like walking around and it's big like when I'm announcing in the ring versus in the cage you know, in the octagon, it's cool. You got the cage, you got everything, and you can move around. In the ring, you could pretty much run around. Like, it's mm -hmm. it's it's massive. Yeah, like, way yeah. bigger. And then, because you're not as cut off visibility-wise yeah. from yeah. the cage, you yeah. get more of the immersive experience, seeing yeah. all the crowd, the cornermen, all that. I think if for, I want to get more animated. I want to be yeah. a little more, you know, like, like, Take the gloves off, all pun intended. If you, <laughs> if you will, um, I want to do that. I want to become like more of a. I don't want to say showman, but it is a show. Mm -hmm. It is part of that, you know. And um, you know, people that know me, like my background, I'm, getting, I'm on your podcast, so we'll talk about our backgrounds, right? <laughs> <laughs> I 
been a performer. I've, I've been a musician since like fourth grade. And you know, I play, I think like 12 different instruments right now. Wow. I'm not bragging. Um, but my grandfather, who was the biggest influence in my life, you know, grew up in like with big bands, like Benny Goodman, Glenn Miller, you know, I don't know, if, you know, you're about <laughs> a 20 some odd year difference between he and I. I'm a, so, I'm a it, 90s baby. Yeah, I know, you're like, same age as my, my son. <laughs> so it's like, ah. Um, yeah, I'm the youngest, mm -hmm. so, my grandfather was like, you're not gonna fuck around, you're not gonna join gangs, you're not gonna do this. So he kept me busy. I played sports, I, you know, and whatever I did, it was like, if I didn't like it, I quit. It was weird, I hated it, I hated that, that pattern that I that I was, uh, was in. Um, but once you start getting down that pattern, you know, mm -hmm. of like quitting, um, it becomes a very, uh, natural thing to do like when you know when the going gets tough the tough get going no no it's like fuck that i was out you know <laughs> <laughs> like i don't want to do it so so you know because i was always looking for that approval you know right uh, you know and that took a year and a half of uh recent so again between these two year hiatus whatever um and i'm not afraid to say it um i did a year and a half of like really hard um therapy because I was going through stuff, you know, again. Um, and with the help of Muay Thai, uh, that was the aggression part, with the help of um, the therapist and all those. The reason why I had a lot of issues, you know, why I did so much, why I was the uh, quintessential jack of all trades, um, you know, but I liked, my, my, my analytical side was like, you're gonna master as many as you can. Mm -hmm. So I played music, um, I was a dancer and a choreographer at one point. Um, that was a whole different crazy time. Um, but fun fact, I did the, in 92, I believe it was, the Bills versus the Cowboys at Rose, in the Rose Bowl Stadium. Oh, um, no I performed with Michael Jackson. Um, yeah, I did that. I even got a t-shirt. <laughs> I look like I'm in a, a needle in a stack of needles, but I got tons of pictures because I smuggled a camera. <laughs> I've got, like a, I've got a, a certificate of authenticity with his signature saying, you know, the whole heal the world thing, and it was crazy. Um, I did, uh, in 94, I did World Cup soccer halftime show with Kenny G and Whitney Houston. Oh, wow. Which was crazy. Smuggled a camera on that one too, got some great pics. I'll throw them up there, it'll be cool. Um, so it was just, again, one door open, another door open, another door open. But I didn't have my mom and dad around, so, it was like, okay, yeah. you, know, you kind of left your own devices. And my grandfather did his best to raise us, but mainly just keep my ass off the streets. Yeah. So I've done a lot of stuff in my life, which again, makes sense. Musician, dancer, comedian, uh, ring announcer, <laughs> like tattoo artist for almost, shit, almost 30 years now. Wow. Yeah, I started tattooing professionally in 95. <laughs> so almost 30 years, yeah. Um, wow. Yeah, and uh, you know, father of five, I have four grandkids. Um, I try to be the best father I can be um, and just to, you know what they say, um, break the cycle, I guess you mm -hmm. can say. Um, that, that's like a, a, like, a, like a religious saying for me. It's I'd rather be an immovable object that collides with the cycle mm -hmm. than a perpetuator and keep it going. Yep. Yeah. And you did say you were you were uh, you study more of the Christian Buddhism or like how did you say it? Uh, so it, it is kind of funny. I messed it up. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it's I would I always kind of associate myself as like a Christian Buddhist because uh, Christianity is primarily what I grew up with religious wise and learning all that stuff. And then Buddhism, I've just always been fascinated with the you know going through the weeks of enlightenment, the Buddha, just hearing all that. And me being a nerd, I read textbooks. I don't read really much fiction at all. Mm -hmm. I read books that goes even like thousands of years back. So like, That's um, good. yeah, like even Plato. Um, I've read stuff about Socrates, even going like um, all kind, of, all kinds of different places. Like even like ancient Italy. Like right now, I'm reading the complete history on Britain from 50 AD to 2012. So like every single king, queen, everybody throughout the entire history. That's pretty cool. I love history. 
Yeah. So that's that's that is one thing about me too. Um, funny story. Um, I got into theology. Like I so I, I in my twenties I was like. I need to figure out why everybody's fighting. Everybody's. This is my religion. This is my religion. I'm like, I got a better religion. My religion's better. Um, and it was weird because I was like, okay, come to find out, you know, after reading and trying to ascertain everything. I mean, no one can tell us definitively, mm -hmm. right? It was so far back. Could be aliens. Could be this. Could be that. You know, there were hieroglyphs of like rockets. Yeah. And people like, coming down from the space, you know, from like the heavens and everything else. Did something happen miraculous way back when? Absolutely, I don't doubt that. Is there a higher power? I believe though, so. maybe you don't, maybe you don't, no big deal, I'm not gonna, you know. It, it's just, there has been so many crazy things that have happened in my life that it's just one of those things where I, I can't not believe in a higher power. And so, yeah. I, I did, I, I my, again, just my opinion is that religion was a big game of telephone. Mm -hmm. Like, did something happen? Yes. Were there a group of people that saw it happen? Yes. But you and I, again, have different opinions, different yeah. ways of seeing things. And so, a different perception yep. of it. And everybody has a network, so they told their friends, their friends told their friends, mm -hmm. and they said, I don't, I don't agree with you on that one. Oh, well, I don't agree with you. That, that's what you saw. Okay. Blah, 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 blah. And mm -hmm. it just branched off. Now, of course, there's a lot of different details because people... You know, um, people mold it to their own way, you know? Yeah. And I remember at my aunt's funeral, now I grew up Catholic, mm -hmm. stand up, sit down, kneel, blah, 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 you know, everything. And I remember I did my first communion, I did, you know, went to catechism, did all that stuff. I, got. I remember all the responses and everything, Lord, hear our prayer, you know, I remember all that. Mm -hmm. And this is what made me think and actually solidify my thought process on why I thought, okay, cool, this is a big game of telephone, and people can change what they want, because when my aunt passed away, I was at her funeral, it was a Catholic funeral, and we were doing all the responses, and I was getting them wrong, because they changed them. Wow. And I was like, huh? And again, solidified why... Um, I was like, okay, I was right. It, throughout the years, it's yeah. you know, it's been changed. So that's the thing that I yeah. do find fascinating with it, because like right now I'm reading the King James version mm -hmm. of the Bible, okay. but also the the book I'm reading at the History of Britain, it also talked about King James and how he purposely altered some of the language in the mm -hmm. Bible yeah. to fit part of what he was wanting to do. And it's just it's fascinating to see because it's like with Socrates, for example, you know, the reason why he was sentenced to death was because he was he was raising these questions in a sense that do we actually know what we know mm -hmm. like at the end of the day the things that we understand in today's era is based off of either what we were told by others mm -hmm. what we were taught in books and what we're like in lectures what we yeah. see on online but the more that you ask why or, at, or start picking apart you yeah. realize that the book was written by a person the person has their own ideological thoughts, their own perception of reality that they also obtain from somebody else who also taught them the, the same stuff. Yeah. And it's just keeps going and going and going. Okay. And it's like, that's why the further back that I read, the crazier it gets because the parallels that I see going perfectly in canon from today's era to oh, back yeah. then, oh, like, yeah. it's crazy. That, this is the whole quintessential history repeats itself. Like people, you, people will say that all the time. Oh, history repeats itself. History repeats itself. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. And then you know, to fit what? Someone's narrative? No way. You don't mm -hmm. say. You know? Yeah. Um, I don't know why I keep throwing my hands up like this. Like, <laughs> you like, sure. Hey, there we go. <laughs> um, but but it's true. It's like to fit someone's narrative, and it happens over and over again. And so then you see these same patterns. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, again, I've been here just a little bit longer than you. <laughs> <laughs> 20 some odd years to be exact it's <laughs> counting um, and then you have all these different things that they're like let's get rid of this let's get rid of that history like again now you know in, in the times now um, if you get rid of it you don't learn from it yep you know you can't you can't change it what's done is done I get it some fucked up shit we get that mm -hmm. but that's not what they're saying what they're saying is like what are we going to do about it in the future for future you know, yeah. um, like my kids, my grandkids, it's still my fight is how I see it. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be very uh, conscious about what's going on and what's being taught and whatnot. 
now that I have four grandkids, I'm like, oh no, like I'm definitely gonna be involved as well. Mm -hmm. And you have, yeah, well, I got yeah, a kid as well. You, yeah. you got a child. Okay, so you have to be very, you know, um, mm -hmm. just on point with yeah. making sure like what's going on, you know, because right now, in my opinion, and this is only my opinion. It's got some wacky shit going on, <laughs> like just wacky stuff. I agree. But I feel like it's because of everything is in our faces. Like it's instant, boom, instant, you know. Uh, and it's an over, yeah. overflow of information. Yes. Like we live in an era where there's so much knowledge with so little wisdom. I agree. And when you have that, what do you have? A shit ton of confusion. Yep. Because you there's no reference. There's no... Hey, let's talk to you know, um, like people. Would, people would laugh at me. I had a habit of going to like, like I love talking to old people. That's living history, yeah. you know. And I would pick their brains. And people are like, "Why are you talking to old people?" Like, because old people are they've been here, they lived it, you know. Yeah. Um, and I want to be that. I want to be like just a ton of knowledge, so I can give it to my kids. I can give it to my grandkids and teach other people you know and, and yeah. I, I commend you for learning and reading and doing everything because then you're going to pour that knowledge into your kid and yeah. he's going to hopefully help other kids and other people and, and not be just like this is the way mm -hmm. I have to do this yeah you know it's funny because I've like I talk about all the time I have a goal where I want to learn everything literally but yeah I also accept at the same time that I know absolutely nothing Literally, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. and that's what Socrates did as well. Because like we could say we know what we know, but at the end of the day, do we really know what we know? As as much of a tongue twister, f fucking around with that. Word is. <laughs> say but, that ten times fast. Exactly. <laughs> and what's fascinating because you said you, you always like to talk to older people. Yeah. One of the things I learned, which is why it is such an important aspect to always learn from your elders, hear their stories, mm -hmm. is that. The only form of intelligence that we have that advances the older you get is crystallized intelligence. Mm -hmm. And the essentially, crystallized intelligence is knowledge obtained through wisdom. Wisdom of age, wisdom of experience, wisdom of years. Mm -hmm. So because they have such a longer reference of society, of history, and everything that goes on, it gives them the capacity to have a more thorough understanding to pass these lessons on. Agree. I love the fact that my job or what I do, um, you know, tattooing and creating art and doing everything, um, it affords me the ability to travel. And I have clients all throughout the United States. I have yeah. clients in Europe. It, it opens your eyes to like amazing things, you know? Mm -hmm. um, in 2014, I was in Milan, Italy. I was tattooing in oh, Milan, wow. Italy. Yep. And visiting the cathedrals, the like just everything about it, you know, like it was, it was, it was fantastic. It was amazing. Now, this is funny because I'm not used to telling my story. Never done it. This is weird. <laughs> so there you go. But 2014, and this is a really funny story. Um, I've always had, you know, again, this fascination with you know, what happens after we die or where does our bodies go? What, I mean, where does our soul, what is the soul? What do we do? Um, you know, and scientific, scientific research shows, you know, protons, neutrons, electrons, we're big balls of energy, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, like if all these lights were out and I was sitting right next to you, you know, or standing behind you or whatever, you would know that I was there because mm -hmm. of that energy transfer, which is the heat, you know, you know, you feel mm -hmm. like, okay, cool. So I always had this fascination with like ghosts and, you know, um, all the different folklore, you know, mm -hmm. about like vampires and werewolves and like, how did all this come about? Yeah. Like, there's some, again, did something happen way back when? Sure, maybe, I don't know. Um, science is trying to prove all these different things, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. whatever. So now that we have aliens, and I'm just throwing that out there, thank you, government. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, bring on the vampires, no. Because uh, <laughs> I know they're out there and here's why. I'm gonna tell you, a funny story that actually happened and um, in Milan, here's the setting. Oh. Milan is the fashion capital of the world. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows that, it's cool, okay, cool. Um, and what was funny was there's some beautiful people out there. Yeah. Like, really beautiful people, which again, 
if you don't have blemishes or a broken nose such as this crooked thing or you know anything like that i'm gonna question if you're alive or not um <laughs> there are these like statuesque people walking around yeah. you know and anyhow we're one of the busiest days and i'm a people watcher so i'm joking with everybody in my booth and i'm like vampire there's another one vampire definitely a vampire like you know like, <laughs> like just joking like having because there are you know with all the folklore and all mm -hmm. the history and all the movies and all the stuff like they've kind of put vampires in a in a coffin in a <laughs> put them in a box you know so so like it was funny. So long story, even shorter, short story, even longer. Um, there's about 27 to 30,000 people in this huge, I mean, it was insane. It was mm -hmm. almost nerve wracking. Like you're like, Oh my God, there's so many people here. Wow. Like what the balls. Um, so there's two lines of just people and there's tons and tons of artists and they're tattooing and everybody's talking and there's music, there's everything going on. So much noise and just there's no way you could hear anybody like talking if we're talking just normally, you know. Mm -hmm. So my jackass was like vampire, yeah, vampire, you know, <laughs> like do this, you know, just and um, all of a sudden this couple just just walking through the crowd mm -hmm. and it's a guy and a girl and she's kind of shortish, you know, not too short, not too tall, but like pixie frame, mm -hmm. you know, still, you know, very fashionable, beautiful lips, beautiful face, beautiful hair, jet black hair. And the one thing I noticed was she had like no pupils. Like she had black eyes. Like wow. she had the white, you know. Yeah. But and she was beautiful. Sorry. Gorgeous. Very. And I was like, oh my gosh. You know, like, what the hell? You know? So I'm sitting there like, huh. And then I see the dude next to her, right, who's like, you can tell he's stocky, you know, and he's got this chiseled jaw, just the right amount of stubble, full stubble. Both of them had no blemishes, no red marks, no scars, no nothing. Wow. Um, and his eyes were kind of black. And mind you, this is in a very well-lit area, and I'm mm -hmm. thinking, why are their eyes black? That was one. I'm in a very detail-oriented job. Yeah. I see everything. Hair, nails, teeth, everything, right? So I see this this couple, and it was funny because my wife goes, why are you checking her out? And I said, <laughs> her, them. The, the thing that caught my eye, which I had to tell somebody, you know, so the thing that caught my eyes, there's this whole sea of people, right? Table, 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 people getting tattoos. Sea of people. And they're walking, but they're walking and nobody's bumping into them. It's really? almost as if nobody can see them. Wow. And they're walking together, but they're like on an escalator. Just kind of gliding. Like just gliding, like, you know, but just smooth. And they're just, they look bored. Mm -hmm. You know, like they're just observing. They're just here. You know, they're just very, you know. And I'm on like a corner booth. Mm -hmm. They're far, like far enough to where I see them. And I'm like, vampires. Definitely. Those two, one hundred percent, without a doubt, vampires. <laughs> and I was told from you know from my wife, shut the fuck up. I'm like, sorry, I can't. And she's like, stop staring. And I'm like, I cannot. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, I'm watching, and I'm watching, and I'm watching, and I'm watching, and. All of a sudden, the girl looks over at me. I mean, makes dead eye wow. contact and looks at me and goes, <laughs> like a little curl smile, Ooh. like a, ah, turns to the dude and goes, <laughs> like, you see her lips moving, but again, it was a weird communication thing, you know, like, <laughs> whatever. And I look at him, he looks at me, dead set, boom, looks me right in the eyes and he goes, <laughs> Like that. <laughs> the story. Gives me the chills every time I tell it. And I'm like, what is going on? You know? So next thing I know, they're walking closer and closer. And she looks at me again. And I mean like, look, look, I'm looking and I'm an asshole. <laughs> I'm not an asshole, but I'm I'm like she's trying to stare me down and I'm like, you can stare me all you want. I'm gonna stay right back. And I'm following her. 
I see you. You know, and, I'm like, <laughs> and she's walking by, and I'm walking, and I'm just like this. Mm-hmm. And she's staring, and I'm saying, and it's intense, dude. I'm like, whoa. Like, wow. It's like staring at my soul, and it was really crazy. And as they're turning, you know, and the guy is just like bored. He's just mm-hmm. walking, you know. And as they're turning, she looks at me one more time and goes, huh? And I'm like, oh, you are the one. Like, I knew it. I fucking knew it. So, <laughs> so I'm like, oh, I was right. So I don't care what anybody says because uh, after that, which was really crazy, um, went to the cathedrals and went to the you know all the other stuff. And I've got tons of pictures. Again, I got pictures of everything. Um, well, we go to the cathedral and and I start asking the bishops and the people that you know like the priests and whatever. Mm-hmm. And I said, so what is the folklore? What is it? What is everything about vampires? And they're like, oh. Uh, like we don't talk about that oh and I was like oh I believe you know again I believe what I saw I mean there's no fucking way that lady there's no way none that she heard me and let alone to look at me and then smile and uh, Especially like acknowledge so far away. get to acknowledge and then to bird whisper to the dude and he's like mm, yeah and then he looks at me too and he's like mm. <laughs> you know like to acknowledge mm-hmm. and so I'm like hmm but the funnier thing was like I ran I, I kind of like I'm gonna go check him out and I couldn't find him so I, when I turned the corner and I'm looking for them they couldn't have gone far you know yeah. the escalator only took them like yeah. you know two miles an hour or whatever or a mile an hour or whatever but it was just crazy to me and the fact that that even happened mm-hmm. and I'm like okay what did I just see yeah you know so then in, in retrospect I'm like I can't find him anywhere the Joker in me was like they're watching me from the rafters. They're like, ah, oh, you can't see me. You know, like they're hanging up. <laughs> I didn't even look up. I was like, oh, there, there they are. You're like, I won't <laughs> give that chance. Yeah. yeah, I was like, bite me, take me. You'll love me. I swear. They didn't want Mexican food. I don't know. Maybe that was that. I'm not used to telling my story. You yeah, know, I'm not used to the one. You know, having somebody. You know, this dialogue that we've been having is like, okay, cool. We can talk about me. I talk about you. We talk about this. We talk about that. Um, and it's kind of catching me off guard a little bit, but at the same time, I'm kind of like, huh, all right. Well, you know, it's like at the, it, until you actually get your feet wet, you're not going to understand how it is. And True. you know, this is my first time where I'm technically being a guest on another show as well. So yeah, yeah. it's entirely new experience for me too. Yeah. Okay. So let's get into some nitty gritty shitty. Uh, how'd you grow up, man? How'd you, you're, you're what? You're 26? Yeah. 26. Okay. So, um, where are you from originally? All over. Funny We're gonna let along great with this one. This will be a good segment. <laughs> I'm, like I can't, I can never really say that I'm from one place because like I've lived in Utah, Cali, cool. Nevada, Arizona, Florida, like literally all over the place. I always just moved around a lot, and I don't know. It, it was very interesting because like as you were saying, you didn't have the best opportunities to grow. Up. That was with me too. Yeah. You know, it's me being the youngest of six. I'm not. I'm the one that they're like most protective of. Mm-hmm. But, you know, like how life is, you know, there's only so much that we could avoid in regards to like things that we go through. And like with, with my family, I always say I'm very passionate and also very protective of my family because, you know, we've lost so many people. We've, uh, I've lost my sister, my dad, my aunt. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, you know, it's, I, I, always, I still say at the end of the day that I've, I've had the privilege to experience the type of life I don't want to live because I also grew up yeah. to an extent, like, in regards to the streets, having to deal with that type of environment where you have bullies, you have violence, there's drugs, alcohol, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And for, for me personally, and I, I really preach that for, for kids and everything, it was very, very easy for me to fall down the wrong path and be the worst version of myself. Yeah. But thankfully, when I was like 14 years old, I was a freshman out in California, actually. Mm -hmm. For some reason, I just had like an innate desire to start reading. And that's how I started reading all the stuff that I do. And then, you know, because of that, because of reading all that I do, instead of allowing myself to become the worst version of myself, Mm -hmm. I made my own conscious choice to be the best version of myself. Gotcha. So that's how I carry myself literally every single day now. It's like... Your, your, your biggest critic, you know, you're oh. gonna be the hardest on yourself. And I always just try to set the example. Yeah, you're your worst critic. And mm. as cliche and crazy as that sounds, it's true. And, and when I look at these videos and I look at different things and I go, oh my God, like, 
you know, and I nitpicked the shit mm-hmm. out of myself. You know, I'm just yep. like, wow, <laughs> really, dude, you look like that, or that's what you sound like, or, you know, um, I mean, I moved around a lot too. My parents divorced when I was a year old, mm-hmm. um, and um, we went to live with my grandparents, like my mom's dad, my mom's dad, and my mom's mom, uh, pretty much for the first you know, um, so like eight solid years, I think, um, were the ones that were very, you know, uh, there constantly. Mm-hmm. And it was crazy because we lived in Alhambra at the time and across the street or across the train tracks, literally across the train tracks was my grandma Valdez, my, my dad's mom and my dad, my, my grandparents mm-hmm. were across there. So, you know, um, <clears throat> It's hard to talk about yourself. Um, you, you would think it's a lot easier, but it's not. I'm the youngest of two brothers and one sister. I have two half sisters now um, that are younger than me. They're twins, mm-hmm. but I have a huge family. Yeah, a fucking huge family. <laughs> like my dad is one of thirteen. My mom's one of eight. I think I have like 165 cousins. I don't know. Wow. It's crazy. Y'all know it's insane. Um, on my dad's side of the family, we used to have these huge family reunions. Okay. My family is so big that we had rival gangs at our family reunion. No shit. That's not a joke. Wow. That's actual truth. Um, and one year, my aunt thought it would be a funny or great idea to everybody, every family wear a their own color, you know? So we look like the biggest gay pride parade, you know, <laughs> in one spot. You know, it was great. It was awesome. Um, but anyhow, um, you know, growing up, with my grandparents, you know, again, my dad wasn't in the picture, you know, for the longest time. Um, and my mom was always busy, she was gone. And it was weird because, you know, being the youngest, I don't remember a lot of actual, you know, um, one-on-one time with my mom. I really don't. I don't really remember it that much about one-on-one time with my dad. Mm-hmm. It's like next to nothing until like, I think, you know, later, you know, mm-hmm. in my youth, <laughs> you know. Um, but my grandfather, always there. My grandfather worked, but still took care of us. Me, made sure we weren't, you know, fucking stupid. And we, yeah. we were fucking stupid. <laughs> you know, we did stupid shit. I, I was blessed to have them in my life because I'd be either dead or I'd be in jail. Mm-hmm. Um, the opportunities were there, again, to live your worst life, to become the worst version of yourself. Drugs were there, gangs were there, doing stupid shit was there. Mm-hmm. Um, and my brothers did it. I kind of tagged along, but I never, I never joined a gang. I never got jumped in. I never, you know, I didn't need to, um, but I fought a lot and I always had, you know, I got jumped. Um, I've been, you know, almost shot. I've been shot at. I've been, you know, like, again, just a lot of crazy shit and music and art and dancing and everything else, you know, again, kept me off the street, like Mm -hmm. as much as it possibly could. Um, but like, recently within I'm talking like the last five years like the early 40s you know for me um, before my grandmother passed away my, my mom's mom you know um, she had given me some truths you know she dropped me with some knowledge and I was like fuck why did you say that <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't good uh, <clears throat> but and I'm gonna get deep here guys I'm sorry we're gonna take a little quick little turn um, she had told me um, that uh, I wasn't wanted. Bottom line, like my parents, they had my sister, my brother, my other brother, and my brother and I are ten months apart. So, you know, Irish twins. <laughs> it's like oh, okay, cool, you know. Um, but I was told that um, you know, my mom would fight with my dad. My dad would fight with my mom. You know, they were. I don't know if they were trying to have a miscarriage or I don't know, whatever. My mom knew that if she pissed off my dad, that he hit her. And my dad knew that if he pissed off my, it just craziness, you know, like, and I was, cause it all stemmed from, I didn't know really much like my history, you know? And I called my, my, my dad. Um, I wasn't talking to my mom. It's really weird. Don't have a good relationship with her. Um, and I don't really have a good relationship with my dad, but I've always tried to. And I called him and I was like, hey, do you have any pictures of me as a kid? He's like, oh yeah, of course I do. I said, cool, you want me to send, can you send me some 
so I can show my kids, you know, and, and we can talk about, you know, who I am and what my history is, you know, whatever. Um, and I got nothing, you know? <clears throat> so I'm thinking, okay, you're my dad. You're supposed to be, you know, you're supposed to have everything, whatever. So then I got like three pictures. Oh, wow. Like he texted me like three pictures. And I asked him again, I'm like, hey, do you have any pictures of me? <clears throat> and he was like, you know who would have those? Your grandma. And I said, okay. So I called my grandma, my mom's mom. And I said, hey, by any chance, do you have any pictures of me as a kid? Because I'd like to show my kids, you know, and say, hey, this is me as a kid, and this is what I did, and, you know, whatever. And she's like, oh yeah, absolutely, you know. Even in her her later, you know, later years of her life, you know, her 90s, um, she sent me two manila envelopes full of pictures. And it was wow. just pictures of me, pictures of my grandmother, her sister, my aunt, my great aunts, my, you know, like, it was history, it was a lot of cool stuff, a lot of black and white stuff too, which was pretty badass. And I was just like, why? Like, why didn't, you know, uh, my dad do that? Or why didn't, you know, stuff like that? And I was, I was pissed. Um, but again, it made sense once she told me, as fucked up as it was, <laughs> like, okay, cool. Which, fast forward, my mid-40s, uh, you know, going to counseling, going to therapy, I unloaded on my therapist, you know, and I was like, yeah. And she goes, well, that's why you have detachment issues. That's why you have abandonment issues. That's why you have trust issues. That's why you have... And I was putting it out there. And I was just like, wow. And it, it all kind of just fell in line. Like, everything was like, doop, 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 doop. And it all made sense. And as shitty as it was to hear all that and to understand it, I had this acceptance, which was really weird. I grieved the loss of my parents already. I know that sounds weird, and I know it sounds fucked up, and there's people that are gonna have one side of the story, and their side, their version, or whoever was told what, but I, it, and it sucks, because they're still alive. Mm -hmm. And they choose, on a daily basis, to wake up in the morning, not talk to my kids, not talk to my their great-grandkids, and then put on Facebook and shit like, oh, I'm so happy for my kid or for my grandson for this, that they don't even fucking know. You know what I mean? And I'm like, you can have a problem with me. You can give care less about whatever I do. And my kids would tell me earlier in the years, you know, when we when I would try to take them over there and, and have family things and they say, oh, you know, grandpa's great. And, oh, grandma's this, you know, whatever. Um, but they didn't know grandma grandpa or the you know the mom and dad that I had the mm -hmm. shit that I went through the abuse that I went through mm -hmm. um you know they didn't get that version and I'm glad mm -hmm. because I mean honestly dude if my dad was the same way he was with me with my kids I probably would fuck him up <laughs> sure. sorry about that but that's true you know I would not let my kids be exposed to that you know again I like to protect our kids um you and I talked you have your child, but you don't bring him into it because mm -hmm. you're protecting your kids. Yeah. I protect my kids in another way. My youngest, though, is now 21. You know, again, I have grandkids now. So my oldest, he's 30, or he's 31, um, and has kids. I love watching them grow. I love being a part of their lives. I love seeing them and doing things with them and teaching them things. And I love it. And it pisses me off how... You could be a grandparent and not give a shit about your grandkids. Fuck you, dude. Like, bottom line, I don't care who you are. I mean, I was lucky to have my grandfather in my life and my grandmother, my dad's mom, in my life as well. Mm -hmm. um, and my grandmother from my mom, you know, I didn't know my, my dad's dad. He, I was way too young when he died. He literally died uh, working. Um, wow. He fell off the ladder. And, and um, but which is crazy because, again, we talk about, you know, the spirituality part and everything. I've had dreams of him. I've seen him. I, you know, like, oh, hey, I know who you are. Mm -hmm. But I've never, like, truly, you know, met him, hung out. I was young. I was a kid. You know, I was a little kid, you know. Um, but my grandfather, my mom's mom, my mom's dad, um, we had a great relationship. And I want to be like that for my grandkids. You know, I want to have, you know, I've got three granddaughters, one grandson, and my grandson is like, yeah, that's my dude. When I was a kid, um, 
I could go to my grandfather and he could give me these things on like how to be a man, how to do this. You know, you go to school, you go to work, you have a family, you know, and that's what you do. And I got a different version of him. I'm sure my mom got a different version of him. I'm sure, you know, people like that. And I get that. And again, it goes back to our theology talking, you know, different yeah. versions to fit different narratives to fit. But the version I got, I was blessed to have. I'm glad I had it. Um, wouldn't trade it for the world. We had a very, very tight relationship, you know. Um, and he died in my arms when I was 18. Man. Yeah. And it was, uh, it was fucked up. Um, I really, I don't really know if I've talked about it. I mean, I've talked about it with my clients. I've never told you guys um, the whole situation. Like, he had uh, congestive heart failure, um, but um, he ended up getting like liquid in his lungs, things like that. Um, and I admitted him into the hospital in the middle of the night. I'm 18. Mm -hmm. What the fuck? Like, you know? Um, yeah. My brothers are shitheads. They don't, you know, do much uh, or didn't at that time. Um, and uh, the family was in kind of like turmoil ish. My mom didn't talk to him. My aunts didn't talk to him. My uncles didn't talk to him. They're just a bunch of. You know, in my opinion, a bunch of fuckers, whatever, whatever. Narcissistic pieces of shit. Anyway, there, I said it. Um, so, you know, here I am taking him, admitting him. In the middle of the night, he ends up going to the uh, ICU. Right? He goes He goes to, um, they switch him, you know. Anyway, um, I thought, you know, I brought him uh, a change of clothes and I brought him all the stuff. And I thought, and we were joking during the day and... Uh, you know, I went home because hospitals are cold. I was in a tank top and shorts. And I was freezing my ass out. Ran home. From the minute I got home, came back. He had already taken like a turn, you know. And, yeah. And, um, you know, I'm not a big emotional guy, which is really crazy. Um, and again, stems from a lot of shit that's happened in, you know, childhood trauma or whatever. Mm -hmm. Be a man. Put some fucking dirt on it. You know, stop being a bitch. Don't cry. That's, that's what, you know, what we're taught. Um, I cried a lot as a kid, um, and there were times where, you know, but I was always told, suck it up, don't do that. So, you know, you, you're told to do something so long, it just yeah. pounded in your brain. So, uh, you know, when I was holding him, because he was gasping for air, you know, that, that breathing, you know, mm -hmm. labored breathing, um, I was holding him, and I realized that tears were hitting the pillow and hitting you know and, and and I was like fuck I'm crying you know like oh shit and I'll, I was looking for the doctors and I'm yelling at the doctors like fuck get in here you know like and they were just oh, you know, and all of a sudden coded um, I was holding him and um, yeah, he just stopped breathing you know wow. and and, and um, fuck dude I lost it I was like what the fuck do I do, you know? And I started fighting everybody. And the, you know, the, all the alarms were going off and all the all the stuff's going down and I'm just like, what is going on? And my, my world is just like spinning and it's loud. And they're like, you need to get out of here. I'm like, you need to shut the fuck up. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. you saved my grandfather, you know, like, do your fucking job. And I was yelling at people and, and I was being told and forcefully removed out of the room. And I was like, fuck you. You focus on your job. Don't worry about me. And I was fighting everybody. I was mm -hmm. fighting nurses. I was fighting, you know, male nurses. Oh, of course, you know. And um, yeah, it was it was a uh, was fucked up. But one nurse, she came up, looked at me, and she's like, "Hey, we need to save your grandfather. He can't see you upset because it'll stress out his heart. So we need you to calm down." And I've got like arms on me. And I got people, you know, my brother's holding on to me, and I'm fucking yeah. pissed and whatnot. And I looked at her and I said, "Please save my grandfather." That was that, and and I walked to the uh, to the ER or to the waiting room, you know, and I lost my shit in there, um, and you know the, the 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 doctor came back and he was like, hey, um, he's on a machine. Okay. Will he ever regain consciousness? No. Will he ever be the same? No. Take him off. And they're like, so that's just what you're gonna do? Yeah. Take him off. And everybody thought, like, why is that? Here's why. I was a kid, and my grandfather would always tell me, if I'm ever on a machine, you pull that. You make sure I'm never on a machine. I was, like, 8 years old. And wow. then, like, 12 years old. And then he always told me, like, every few years, if I'm ever on a machine, you take that. I never want to be on a machine. So it was almost like, again, 
That's what he wanted to do. Mm-hmm. So that's what I did. And yeah, it's fucked up. We're gonna take a quick break. Thanks. Um, yeah, shit. Took a took a a turn down the the old familial <laughs> trauma <laughs> trauma well, train. <laughs> it's like what we were talking about before. You know, it's part of wanting to share our story is to have a meaningful impact on other people that, if not are currently going through it, have gone through it, and it, it lets them know that they're not alone in a sense. Because True. you know, we especially nowadays we live in a world where everybody is so cut off that we no longer really have that same sense of true understanding, empathy of Mm -hmm. the hardships everybody faces, what they had to do to become the best version of themselves. And, you know, that's why I always uh, preach on my end, you know, it's uh, lead by example in a sense of, I've had the privilege to know the type of life and the type of environment I don't want to be in. And now it's a bigger motivator for me to be able to want to help other people. Like with my losing my sister, I lost her when I was, 12 years old and you know she was absolutely fascinated in love with psychology she Mm -hmm. always wanted to become a psychologist and that was her main focus and even to this day I own uh, all of her psychology textbooks and her literature books and that's been a a main driving point because like since then now psychology is one of my favorite subjects and I study it also with the intent of how I can not only help and improve myself, but what can I also do to help others? Yeah. I mean, and that's, that's very, you know, that's, it's very admirable. It's very, um, you know, it's, a, it's one of those things that, like you said, you want to change the world. Mm-hmm. Okay. The world's a very big place, but it's also very small. You mm-hmm. know, when that, that whole, hey, it's a small world. It is. Um, once you leave the country, once you start traveling and you start doing things and you start, you know, um, experiencing you know, life and creating life experiences. You know, mm-hmm. you talked about age and, and wisdom comes with age and everything else. I agree, but I also have met some really, you know, younger people such as yourself that have immersed themselves in philosophy and books and everything, and, and that's a lot of wisdom. Mm-hmm. Um, my brother used to use this joke all the time. I can't go anywhere without being noticed. He would tell me, my brother's famous. I'm like, I'm not famous. Not yet. <laughs> but um, he would tell me, because I did so many things, you know, and I was in the camera. I made a music video with Perry Farrell and Porno Papyros, you know, as wow. a dancer. Yeah, it, it was on MTV, on tons of rotation. Like, again, I've had people tell me, dude, what the fuck don't you do? Like, you do so much. I'm like, it's because I have issues. <laughs> <laughs> I have, we talked about that. Detachment issues, you know, like acceptance. Like, I need to do stuff in order to feel, not that I belong, but I just need to do things. You know, like, who's, who starts Muay Thai at 45 mm-hmm. and then still enjoys the hell out of it? And, yeah. and, you know, I do, I did, it's great. It's not something that I needed. I mean, it is something that I needed, but I remember, <clears throat> cause I did property management for 13 years also. Okay. Like multifamily housing. Um, and I worked for one of the, the biggest multi-billion dollar company privately owned company, Lewis Operating Corp. And that's in Ranch Cucamon, California. And the Lewis family are phenomenal. They're great people. I enjoyed working for them. And my residents, and I still talk to some of my residents to this day. This was way back when. Wow. Um, You know, creating those relationships, meeting people. We like to go camping. We're a very outdoorsy family. We like to go out, uh, Kings Canyon National Forest. And Mm -hmm. you know, it's it's, uh, just out of Acelia, California, Northern California. Um, giant sequoia trees and you go out there and you drive in there and you have to get like an hour and a half in there mm-hmm. no cell service no Wi-Fi it's fucking gorgeous dude beautiful so we're out there my family's out there I literally have a stack of logs and an axe in one hand and we're campsite 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 and we hear and I, I look and I hear Matt Valdez and I'm like shut your fucking mouth <laughs> it was one of my residents Wow. How the hell did you find me there? You know, like in my sanctuary, you know, that's my spot. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and then what was really funny was, um, my son, okay. We have the Muir, John Muir, you know who John Muir is? I've heard the name before. So he's the one that, uh, him and Teddy Roosevelt and all other, you know, people just started the national parks and he was, oh, that, okay. you know, and okay. he was a very advocate, a huge advocate for starting national parks and doing everything else like that. So, 
there's this huge rock where he used to congregate and teach, you know, and, and Bible studies and all this other mm -hmm. stuff. Well, we call it Party Rock because it's got like a 13 foot drop into ice cold water, crystal clear, fantastic. Wow. You jump off, whatever. So one year, my son, my oldest, decides, Dad, I think I want to do this naked. I was like, I'm sorry, <laughs> what? And he goes, I want to do this naked. I said, fuck it, no one's out here. Like, who's, who's going to see you, the giant trees? So he stands there and he's like, Foom. And my best friend was with me, my best friend Seneca was with me in our family, and he's dying laughing because his, you know, he's also asthmatic. So he's like dying. And we're crazy family. We're fucking gonna do it, whatever. So my son, butt naked, jumps off the rock, whoop, into the water, right? And this random guy comes out of nowhere and goes, hey, bro, I'm gonna do it too. Whoop, oh. jumps, and fucking whoop, and now we got two people jumping butt naked. So we're like, what the fuck is going on, right? We're all dying laughing. It's really, really, really funny. Anyhow. Fast forward, I'm in LA. Man, mind you, Northern California, Southern California. Mm -hmm. There's a big difference, like 12 hours, you know, not 12 hours, like, you know, six hours, whatever. Yeah. Um, but I'm at a party in East LA with my best friend and his niece and sister and everything. And in walks this dude. And I was like, that guy looks so familiar. Where the fuck do I know this guy from? And so he starts talking to her, his niece, and I'm like, where are they from? He goes, I'm like, you're the naked dude. <laughs> you jumped. You jumped off the. Like, you jumped off Party Rock, butt naked with my. And he goes, "Oh my god!" And we're just like, "What the hell?" Like it was just. It was funny. Like what are the chances? You know. So so again, small world. Like you will bump into people. Like yeah. I jumped on a plane. I was heading to New York, and this girl, this you know, woman, you know, she's staring at me. Finally, looked at her, and she goes, "You look familiar." So, so this lady just can't stop, you know, telling me, she's like, you look familiar, you look familiar. And I was like, you know, you watch porn? She's like, no. And I said, okay. Um, and she's like, I know you, I've seen you. And I said, well, okay. Mind you, I'm living in Arizona at this time. Mm -hmm. And she said, you were at the ice house in Pasadena. You're a comedian. And I went, oh, what the balls? Like. Half of me was like, what? I just got noticed. And the other part of me was like, what? I have a stalker? No. Um, <laughs> so so it, was, it was crazy. But I said, yes, you're right. And she goes, you're funny. And she starts telling me about jokes that I've done, like my bit. And, my, you wow. know, and I'm like, do I have a stalker? Like, I may have a stalker. That's awesome. <laughs> and what a small world. I performed in Pasadena, California all the time. I performed all in, up and down, you know, um, all the comedy clubs in California. I performed out here in Arizona. I performed in Dallas, Texas. I performed in New York. Mm -hmm. I performed all over the place. But to have somebody actually see you, I had no idea who this person was. Hell, how the hell? She's in Phoenix Sky Harbor. I'm in Phoenix Sky Harbor. Like, just everything lines up in such yeah. a weird situation. So I don't believe in coincidences anymore. I believe in, I do believe in that, you know, energy transfer and all this mm -hmm. other souls and whatnot. Everything happens for a reason. I mean, that is one of the most obvious statements ever made. <laughs> but, but I mean, it's true. I mean, um, you said you read, you, you read a lot of books, mm -hmm. you know, you believe in the, the traveling soul, if you will, mm -hmm. you know, um, there's this book that was called um, Journey of Souls. Okay. And I read that, and it was this psychotherapist who accidentally, like, deeply hypnotized one of his uh, clients or patients. And she started talking about how she was a man and she was living thousands of years ago, but she came back in this life as a female because in another life she was a female and she preferred to be a female. What the balls? So, I got intrigued and I started thinking about it. I started reading, I started reading more. And it's all these different case studies, all these different things, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm just like fascinated by that. I'm like, wow. So then I started thinking, again, me being very analytical, I started thinking to myself, what if there's this huge cosmic shift right now where aliens are coming out, real truths are coming out, people are thinking they're men when they're really women, and, and everybody's all confused as to how many damn sexes there are, and, and mm -hmm. genders and whatever the hell that is. What if there is this cosmic shift right now and 
our souls are all like intertwined, like just like colliding, like yeah. just colliding and becoming uh, almost like the radio frequency and the noise and mm -hmm. the the white noise and the. Um, I mean, this might be way before you, but we had old TVs that when you turn them a certain way, you got your souls static. Oh yeah, I remember, <laughs> I remember the, even that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, bug races. That's what we called them. Um, but I mean, it's just a theory of mine that is the reason why people are like, I think I'm a girl when you're a dude, or a girl is, I think I'm a, and there's so, so much confusion. Because they've gone through, like they've reincarnated in different forms. I think, forms. I think okay. there's some, I'm again, just my thought process, whatever. Um, when I was a kid, I used to have these reoccurring dreams that were so vivid, right? Super vivid, um, that I was in Vietnam, and I was, you know, a young private in the army or, mm -hmm. you know, in the military and we we're in the jungle and I was, da, 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 da. we took on some fire and all of a sudden, boom, I get shot in the head. Very, 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 very specific. Like, yeah. boom, shot in the head. And I watched myself die. It was crazy. It was just this weird out of body thing, you know? Or, yeah. Yeah. That's why, that's why I always think of it like being Christian Buddhist because, I mean, even studying ancient Christianity, ancient religion, a lot of it believed in reincarnation. Oh, yeah. And yeah. so, like, part of the whole process of evolving and to overcome all those things is that you, each life that you live is to gain an additional perspective. Like, I, I agree. Uh, who's, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, he actually uh -huh. talked about, like, a concept that we're all the same soul, yep. but we're living all the infinite different lives in order to acquire all the infinite um, infinite perspectives. There's got to be more, obviously. You know, again, our little brains and whatever like you said you want to learn everything you want to do everything um so much okay and this is just again a little tangent whatever but when i was a kid and i would have those dreams and you know every kid played war we all played gi joe we we're all out there just pop 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 you know there may be guns my uncle jim was in vietnam you know and he came back fucked up he was you know i i, I really do feel for our military and you know um for PTSD and everything else that wasn't understood way back when. And it was called shell shock. Yeah, before. shell shock and oh, you just, you know, you saw things and whatever, why not? You saw atrocities, you saw some bad stuff. But my my aunt, who I absolutely loved to death, my Aunt Rhonda was, uh, was with my Uncle Jim, and I loved her so much. Her being was just angelic. She was such a sweetheart. Everything was great, one of my favorite. Um, she was killed by a drunk driver. Oof. And it sent my uncle spinning. And he was already fucked up. So he got even more fucked up. And one day we we're out there in his like trailer compound type thing that he had. He lived very secluded in Marietta, California. One night I was sleeping and I woke up in the middle of the night and um, I went to go to the bathroom. And he was sleeping on, on the floor of the trailer that you know we were in. And he just grabs a hold of my, my ankle where are you going? And I said, uh, to the bathroom? I would have screamed. And he's like, you know, you're not supposed to be out, or I say, you're not supposed to be past the wire by yourself, or you're not supposed, he's like, and he starts saying like, you know, oh. he was having a flashback. And I was like, uh, okay. He goes, make sure somebody's with you. You know, and I was like, well, I don't think I have to go to the bathroom anymore. Uh, whatever's left is going to stay till the morning. You know, I'm like, what the fuck? Like, wow. And so he was tripping. So the reason why I think it was crazy was because um, I remember uh, playing war and I was describing, um, I was describing foliage. I was describing the landscape of the, the reoccurring dream that I've had, you know, and and being out there with, you know, the company or the platoon or whoever I was with, and I was saying things that were very specific, and he knew it, and he lost his shit. Wow. There was a helicopter going off. I was, I was like, everybody off the Huey, and I was just, I was saying things that I thought, you know, I was a kid. The yeah. Fuck, how would I know this? And it turned out to be language only, or lingo that was only yeah. used in that setting. He grabbed me. I'll never forget. He grabbed me by the fucking collar and he was like, are you going through my shit? What are you doing? How do you know this? Who are you talking to? And I was like, oh my God. Like nobody. I'm playing fucking G.I. Joe. 
how sh- how would I know this, right? Wow. And he he did. He lost his shit and he was pissed and he was mad at me. He went through his stuff and I'm like, okay, I can't be here anymore. And I did. I I was like, fuck this. I'm never going to Michael Jim's house. Now as an adult, you know, in, in retrospect, I start thinking of these things and these stories. I'm like, what happened with this? Like, this is just you know, is this just did I? I've had a lot of head trauma. Don't get me wrong. I've had a TB a TBI. Um, and um, yeah, my head cracked open, and um, it's weird. Did you know? Did it something unlock? You know? Did something? I don't know. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not there yet. I'm not as enlightened as I should be. But learning, I'm 100% on board with learning. Like, I grew up poor. I grew up with not a lot of money. You know, my patches had patches. So whenever something was offered, like, hey, Matt, do you want to learn how to be uh, forklift certified? Sure. And I taught it. I learned. Mm-hmm. Hey, Matt, you want to go scuba diving? How do you do that? Well, you got to take a certification through Patty. Let's go. Yeah. And I did it. And I have fun. So again, this whole thing with, Matt, what don't you do? I mean, I don't stop learning. How about that? <laughs> like, I, I, I enjoy it. And obviously, I never shut the fuck up. So, um, you know, uh, uh, hey, that's what you guys signed up for. This is the reintroduction yeah. to, you know. Well, what, what I like, too, is that, you know, it's like, it seems especially it's harder for people to want to feel comfortable in expressing themselves or even just to have genuine, honest dialogue and yeah, civil discourse. Sure. And that's why, like, with... Josh said, what? I want to be able to have a platform, almost like a safe space, where we have the ability to agree to disagree or to be able to have genuine positive dialogue that can have an actual effect on people in a good way. True. And, you know, it's like, that's why I really push for a lot of that because, you know, it's like what I was saying Socrates, at the end of the day, how do we know what we actually know unless we actually have the dialogue? If we don't understand the history, how can we understand the present and the future moving forward 100 and that's why like with me i've always been like i i out of everything i want to be like a modern day philosopher because like yeah. plato socrates aristotle um i always forget her name and it breaks my heart but she's from ancient greece she was one of the first female philosophers and she came up with the term anarchic truth which means that there is a the potential of an infinite number of truths that exist so like for example how a one specific workout works out for you mm-hmm. but it may actually harm, harm me sure. and then vice versa sure. i may have a workout but so sure. it's like yeah. that's where it also plays into like everything going on now and victor frankel too he's another uh jewish psychologist bit of a philosopher that like i greatly admire mm-hmm. that if anything because like i said i believe in reincarnation i feel like i have a link to victor frankel because what he observed and pointed out when he was going through the Holocaust because his entire family was taken in by the Nazis and put mm-hmm. in Auschwitz, the other internment camps, pretty much all of his entire family, even his brand newly wed wife, they all were killed in internment camps, all, only except for their co- for one of his cousins. Yeah. But one thing he pointed out was that amongst all of his friends that were in the internment camps, he made the observation that while there were others that the environment got the best of them and they went from becoming from being saints to just like hard, rough, crude people because it got best or better them, there's other people that, you know, they, they were saints and they stayed that way. They didn't let the environment get the better of them. Mm-hmm. And like in our yeah. scenario, he made the observation that the environment doesn't genuinely have that impact on you. At the end of the day, you are your own sovereign individual and it's your choice with what you do with it. I do agree, you know, again, with with your philosophies, you know, how everything just lines up and everything happens for a reason. Mm -hmm. And it's true. I mean, for the obvious reason, but Mm -hmm. that path, and we always see, you know, here, walk your path, Mm -hmm. know your path, do your, trust your path, you know? Um, I feel like there are things that have led me to where I am. I mean, obviously led me to where I am, but I've moved around a lot. I've lived in different places. I lived in Utah mm-hmm. for four years. I, I lived, lived in Rancho for, yeah. for a year or two. And, and it's weird how, like, I think that, you know, this was meant to happen. And again, just my own thoughts. Uh, this was meant to happen. Um, one of the reasons why I started Beyond the Ink was 
to tell people stories, to help people move through their lives as well. And I've had a really good, I mean, I think we did 25 or 26 episodes before COVID and then COVID really jacked everything up. Yeah. Um, but I was on really, we were doing really, really well. Uh, my partner, Austin and I, um, and COVID really fucked up a lot of things. Austin's a really good dude. Um, but he had to pull away from, from, uh, Beyond the Ink. Losing him as the editor and partner, uh, I, I stopped Beyond the Ink for like two years. This is, you know, again, the resurg resurgence, if you will, you know. Um, I'm coming back here. I feel like the need to tell more stories because my clients in Texas would tell their stories and it would affect somebody, my clients out here in Arizona. Mm -hmm. And then my clients in Arizona telling their stories affected my clients in New York. And then my clients in New York were like, oh God. And my clients in California were like, oh my gosh, like I really, it really just resonates with me, that client in Texas. And I'm like, cool. So it really uh, helped me to say, I'm on the right path. Mm -hmm. that I, this needs to happen again. Then I meet you and it's like, cool. We were on the same kind of you know wavelength as far as like trying to help the world, trying to change, mm -hmm. you know, change the world in, in however significant it is. Um, I met Ethan, who is also, you know, the he, he does videography and photography for Samurai Soul and uh, Freedom Fight Night. He was there as well. So, like, again, it's this circle of, mm -hmm. you know, people that I'm bumping into. So, he's going to help me with my editing. You've offered to help me with the editing. Like, this is great. This mm -hmm. is something that, again, all the signs were there. Everything yeah. was there. Everything. Matt, get off your ass and start Beyond the Ink again. And so, I was like, okay doing it and here we are yeah you know that's, that's why like i say the same thing you know every, everything happens for a reason like when like what i said with psychology you know I, I never really understood why fully i started studying psychology philosophy it was just like for some reason like something clicked and mm -hmm. i had to do it but now as like it progresses and you know for up until i was about like 1920 i had no clue whatsoever what i wanted to do with my life every like you were saying, you know, it fell into the pattern of quitting in a sense that I bounced from one thing to the next and I just couldn't find the actual ambition of what I wanted. Yeah. And then it was actually the Joe Rogan podcast. That's what like finally clicked with like what I wanted to do. I wanted to have a podcast. I want to get into combat sports. I want to commentate. Yeah. And it was just crazy because now it's like every single episode that I do or like every single person I encounter, it's, it's almost freaky scary how much of the stuff that I study and read literally connects directly to all of it. Yeah. You know, the it's, ability to have all this dialogue is yeah. crazy. Yeah, and, and I think it's because once you allow yourself to reach another level, like, a, you know, Ken, the level of learning, the level of, of being, and I hate to say this, I won't say it, woke, um, it's not gonna be that. But you know, when you're-, when I you're say enlightened. Enlightened, yeah. that's a very good way of saying it. Um, you're opening yourself up to vulnerability. You know, mm -hmm. like I wouldn't have told that story that, you know, about my grandfather. I wouldn't, and there's a lot more to it, you know, and, and I wouldn't have told you know, a lot of the stuff that we talked about. Again, mm -hmm. my first time telling my story to you folks, um, it's a little bit different. It's, mm -hmm. it's, there's a lot more, you know, there's a lot more layers to myself, you know, mm -hmm. um, but a lot of that I keep still guarded, you know, um, I build walls. I do, you know, I, again, I have trust issues. I have things like that, but you know, again, you referred to Joe Rogan's podcast, like Joe Rogan was somebody that I watched since like he was doing fear factor mm -hmm. and then he started becoming a commentator and UFC, you know, he had a little bit of hair. Um, we, you know, <laughs> it's okay to punch me in the face. No. Um, but I, again, I started following that and now as being an, an adult, you know, everything that I, that I started and then quit, like I played Pop Warner football, didn't like it. I was a short fat kid. It wasn't my thing. Played baseball. I was good. Didn't like it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Stop doing that. I, you know, there were things that I would consider, you know, when people say, oh, you're quitting, you're quitting. Well, I didn't have a support system. Mm -hmm. I didn't have people pushing me, telling me, hey, you know, uh, you can do it. You can be successful mm -hmm. you can, you know, uh, um, graduate high school with honors. You can, uh, I was always talked down to like, oh, you're, you're a dancer. You must be this, you must be that. I was like, no, the ratio from guys to girls, 
like thousand to one. Mm-hmm. You ever been in one of those competitions? Wall to wall girls. Mm-hmm. I was very heterosexual, and I was like, <laughs> and I'll never forget. It's really funny. It's funny, funny, just funny story about dancing. I remember the first competition. First, we we're in a school. You see, you see buses. I was new to all this. And I went into it completely blind, you know. And that's what I like to do when I learn something new. I go into completely blind. My grandfather taught me, do something as if you know nothing about it. Even if you know everything about it, go into it knowing nothing. Yeah. You know, so you can learn. Purest form of learning. Cool. So here I am at this school, and we get into the staging area, you know, where it's like our turn, you know. And back then in the '90s, you know, it was like I. 93 or 92 I think it was there weren't co-ed you know it wasn't a thing yet it was starting to be but it wasn't a co- it wasn't a co-ed thing you know um and so there were guys that were dancing but most of them were gay so it was like heterosexual men, you know guys doing you know the dance it wasn't a thing so but it was a thing for me because I was like damn there's curls everywhere <laughs> that's awesome um <clears throat> I remember walking out there True story. I walked out there and the bleachers on one side, wall to wall girls, girls on the side of bleachers. The bleachers that we were walking away from, wall to wall girls. All of a sudden, I looked over and I was like, fuck this. I am not doing this. I was like, not gonna do this. You know, I'm like, nope. And my whole, my, my ability to want to quit was like so strong like just yeah. don't do it you, you don't have to do it you know and I almost didn't do it but my dance teacher Miss Julian phenomenal Miss J I love you um, she said okay we're gonna have a conversation I said sure and she was always very very uh, very very upfront and very brutally honest <laughs> um, teachers couldn't talk like that now anyway um, and she said, you can go out there and be a pussy and mess up and you'll never get a date for the rest of your high school career. And that'd be fine. Or you can go out there and without saying, fuck the, the front row, <laughs> you know, like have a good time, do a great job, be successful, and you'll never have to worry about a date for your high school career because Big door number two. And I went out there and the sound, the amount of women, girl, or girls just screaming because there were guys. Yeah. They were screaming so much and we couldn't hear the music. I, I know music, thank God, because I could hear doom, 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 doom. And we had a basic roll. We lifted, we turned, the girls walked away, did their thing, and then boom, we walked forward. Did our little thrust, blah, and that was it. That was the whole, you know, gist of what we did. I went out and I lifted my partner and I swung her around, brought her down. I was like, oh yeah, walk forward, uh, uh, and I was like, bam, bam, and fuck the front row. <laughs> like, ding, 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 you know, and I just this huge hip thrust, and I was like, yeah, and it was so loud, it was so crazy, and I walked off, and I was like, I'm gonna shit my pants, that was insane. <laughs> Why would I get it? But then after that, that was my first lesson in women, that you are way worse than men, um, when it comes to cat calls and everything else like that, but then I got addicted to the adrenaline, that feeling, it was great, and I ended up doing it for, you know, years after, and it was way better than playing football, way better than playing baseball, way better than, you know, doing stuff like that. It was just, it was an adrenaline high that mm-hmm. I loved, and I was going to do it until I didn't have to do it anymore, and it was awesome. So, yeah, I do understand when you say learn without knowledge. If you're, yeah. Like, go into something without that preconceived notion that... Mm-hmm. You know exactly what it is. You may not know exactly what that is. Tabula La Rasa. There you go. So, um, yeah, man, this has been great. This has been a really good episode to start it off again. Um, it's been a long one. I mean, if you guys are still with us, I thank you. Um, I mean, obviously, our editing is going to take place. I lost that camera over there, so. I guess it's probably telling me it's time to shut the fuck up. <laughs> Josh, dude. Thank you, no, honestly, thank you, man. man, for 
doing this, um, for helping me get back out here. Um, if there's anything I would say I can do to help you, um, let's 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 break down some doors, man. Let's let's get the fight world involved and do all this other good stuff. And um, but like I said, if you guys are still there with us, um, hit that subscribe button, share it, talk to everybody about it, tell everybody you know, hey, this is this is good. We like this. Um, and if you have a good story you want to be on Beyond the Ink, put a comment down below. If you want a good tattoo that you want me to do, and we'll talk about it, and I'll stab you. We'll be good. I feel like we need another episode because maybe down the line um, we'll do another episode of like you know uh, uh, more tapping into this. But it's been great. It's very cathartic. <laughs> Telling your own story is one of those things that you don't really do. But I had a good time doing it. So um, I thank you again. Um, keep an eye out for us. Beyond the Ink back, and I'm gonna try to get these episodes out. You'll see more new people. I might even bring back some old clients as my more of a like a where are they now? So stay tuned. Um, follow me on Instagram at artist Matt Bell D's with uh, one T and two E's. And you know, we'll have the links below. I'll put it everywhere it needs to be. Um, that sentence sounded really dirty. <laughs> Damn comedians. But I thank you for watching. Until next time, folks, be safe, be good to one another, and yeah, follow us again for Beyond the Ink. Follow us everywhere on social media. Follow this gentleman right here. Josh said what? And let's change the world, guys. Let's do it. Oh, yeah. Until next time, see you later. Peace.